This is flipped mini lecture number 15. First thing we're going to cover is drag. A little like friction, not exactly. Then we're going to pop all the way up to 7.3, Newton's third law. So first, drag. The formula for drag is this, F drag. Well, it's going to have a magnitude and it's going to have a direction. And the magnitude is this, 1 half C rho A V squared. And the direction is opposite of the velocity V. So what are all these things? V, this little V here with no vector symbol over it, that's just short for the, the magnitude of the velocity. The velocity is the velocity of the object in question. The object that something is dragging on. And so uh, ignoring all these constants for a second, which I haven't defined, this says that the amount of drag is proportional to the velocity squared. So if one object is going 5 kilometers per hour and another object is going 0.5 kilometers per hour, and all these constants are the same for those two objects, then the one that's going 0.5 miles per hour, because its speed is one-tenth um, the one that's going 5 kilometers per hour, is experiencing one one-hundredth of the drag. And then the direction of drag is always in opposition to the direction of motion. Okay, so what are all these constants? These constants are just a convenient way of sorting out the problem, okay? So uh, rho is the density of whatever the material is that you're moving through. So rho uh, for air, there's a value in the textbook, and it's going to be some number of grams per cubic meter. And A is the cross-sectional area of the object. So suppose this is a boxster. I'm trying to make a little coop, looking at it head on. And this is a Range Rover. I'm making another vehicle, a big boxy vehicle, looking at it head on. There's the wheels below the headlights coming at you. So this, A, for the Boxster, because the Boxster, if you look at it head on, doesn't present much area to you is whatever that area is. And if a boxster is maybe about two meters wide and about one meter high, then uh, that's two square meters. Okay, now if this range over here is also about two meters wide, but it's two meters high, like almost six feet or over six feet, um, then that would be two by two is four square meters. So the area is involved. The density of the medium you're passing through and the area and the velocity squared. And then there's this one more thing. If you look at the boxster from the side, it's got a very pleasantly slippery shape. So now I'm looking at the side view of the boxster. And if you look at the Range Rover from the side, not only is it bigger from the front, but from the side you can see that it's kind of a bad boxy shape. And so your experience here will be that even if the cross sections were the same, this boxy shape is going to have a harder time moving through the air than this nice slippery shape. And that's true, and that's captured by in this constant out front here, capital C, which is called the coefficient of drag. So this is just a property of the air. This is just a geometrical property of the, of the thing, of the object, as you look at it head on or whatever direction it's moving through the air, whatever cross section it's presenting. This is the uh, speed squared, and this is this coefficient. And it happens, by the way, that the coefficient for a Boxster is 0 0.29. Actually, it turns out the coefficient for the Honda CRX is also 0.29, whereas the coefficient for the 
uh, Range Rover is 0 0.45. So not only is the Range Rover a lot harder to push through the air because its cross section is bigger, but it's also harder to push through the air because it's got this boxy shape. Bigger and boxier. Okay, so now the other formula that uh, just comes up in drag, that's formula 6.15. The other formula that comes up in drag and is about the only interesting formula that you can derive from that formula is the terminal velocity. So if I have an object that is going in some direction with some force being applied to it, let's say it's, it's going downward and the force is just the good old force of gravity. Well, I have mg in the downward direction. Let's assume it's going downward. Let's assume it has speed v. There's going to be some drag force, f drag, in the upward direction. And initially when you drop this thing and it hasn't picked up much speed it's going to keep accelerating downward but at some point it's going to pick up so much speed that the for that the drag force is going to equal the gravitational force so we have mg in the downward direction and f drag in the upward direction and what we need to do is just equate those two things and when the, the velocity has written, risen so high that, these, that this force equals that force, then it doesn't accelerate anymore. So let's equate those two things. mg equals 1 half c rho a v squared. And then let's solve for v by throwing all that junk over to the other side. The 1 half in the denominator comes up as a 2. So now we have 2mg over c rho a is equal to v squared. And of course, we can take the square root of both sides, and we get that. And that is 6.16. And what it says is, this is a formula for the terminal velocity of an object. That's how fast it can go with some force. In this case, the force was mg applied to it. That's how fast it will act, its speed will, will get up to and go no faster um, if you wait long enough. So that really is all there is to say about drag, and I've got you a few homework problems that allow you to apply those equations. So let's go all the way up to 7.3. And you should read 7.1 and 7.2. And then I'm going to explain here 7.3. So 7.3 is Newton's third law. You'll notice that so far, all the way up to chapter 6, all the way into chapter 6, all of our problems have only involved, they've really only involved one object. You never had to write down any equations for a second object. And until you introduce Newton's third law, it's actually kind of hard to uh, do problems that involve multiple objects, but once you introduce Newton's third law, then a whole bunch of things become uh, possible to do. So let's suppose we've got a problem, and it just happens to have two objects that we call A and we call B. So we've got our two objects A and B here. And the picture I have in mind is that A and B are both on the same slope, and maybe they're both boxes or something like that. Doesn't really matter. Let's go back to just imagining these objects kind of abstractly. Ignoring B for a second, even though I just introduced it, let's look at the forces on A. Maybe there's a gravitational force, Fg, which is in the downward direction. Uh, maybe it is sitting on a plane, and there's a normal force to the plane in that direction. And uh, maybe it's uh, going this way along the plane, so there's a, a frictional force backwards. And then uh, maybe somebody's towing this thing pretty hard with a, a tow rope in that direction. So there's a tension. And now, mm, let's keep B maybe just a little simpler. B might also have a gravitational force, a normal force, and a frictional force on it. And now, let's bring A into contact with B. 
So imagine these are two things sliding down some kind of plane, and thanks to the fact that this one's being towed, it's caught up and now is touching the back of B. I'm gonna change colors just to add something here. And if A bumps into the back of B, now A is pushing B. And of course, B, which has been bumped into, is kind of pushing back on A. So we're gonna have a force back in that direction. And we label this um, the force of A on B. And we label this the force of B on A. And now I'm ready to state Newton's third law. Newton's third law is whatever this is, the force of A on B and the force of B on A, whatever they are, there's something that's always, always, always true, which is that the force of A on B is equal to minus the force of B on A. Now, what does this say? It says that the one thing it says is that the magnitude of these two forces is the same. Because if I have a vector equation, I can always take the magnitude of both sides. This minus sign doesn't matter when I'm taking the length of a vector. Um, so one thing this equation says is that the magnitude is the same. And the other thing this equation says is that the direction is opposite. So one way you'll sometimes hear Newton's third law stated is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is the precise mathematical way to say it. And uh, this is basically huge because uh, there's an awful lot of problems that involve more than one object that there's no way you could solve unless you add this additional fact into the solution of the problem. And we will get into those towards the end of class on Thursday and get further into it on Friday. And the good news about that is, is that will leave us maybe just a little more of Chapter 7 to wrap up early next week. And then we'll have all of the next two weeks to do 8 and 9, which I think are really tricky chapters, especially 9 when things start getting subtle. Um, and we need to cover all that stuff uh, before the middle of the term, and we're on track to do it. Okay.